a lot of the uh, of our Virginia representatives and politicians. Uh, and the Speaker of the House uh, was very complimentary and said, uh, thank you for the inspirational prayer. And we were looking forward to the day we get to meet you in person. And uh, I, was, I was shocked. I was shocked at the uh, response from those. So I know there's probably a lot in government that, that feel that way, Brother Carmel, but I think that maybe, I think perhaps there are also several that uh, are believers in God and, and things. So I think if we pray like you say, I think like you're saying, talking about, we could see God move uh, back to, you know, some, some biblical foundations. And so that's what we need to pray. But that was an honor for me. I, I've never been able to do anything, you know, I didn't know if I talked plain enough, and had, I know I had a Southwest Virginia accent, but uh, I just prayed like I would pray, and uh, it was it was good. So let's let's be in prayer for that. Anybody else? Anybody else? Would somebody like to, uh, well, all those with special and spoken requests, we know we're raising your right hand. Would somebody like to come and lead us in prayer tonight? So, uh, any volunteer? I thought, thank you, Brother Andrew. I thought uh, somebody was coming in from ancient Israel there with their, their robe over their head. <laughs> Brother Rocky, come in with his coat over his head.
Rick, is there one back there, Zach? They may have grabbed it. Okay. I thought maybe they may have taken it over there. All right, if you'll open up your Bibles uh, to Revelation, and we'll go, you know what chapter we're going to there, anybody? 17. I don't know how long we've been there, but let's go to Revelation 17 as the foundation and uh, for tonight's study. We're going to get into the New Testament tonight. Isn't that exciting? We're actually going to get into the words of Jesus concerning what we're studying. So in Revelation 17, tonight we're talking about the, the New World Order, the religion part of it that comes at the, that uh, passes through the Roman Empire and the elements there that, that we're going to find. So uh, in Revelation 17, it looks like I did send a PowerPoint this time. So we're going to talk about Rome. We're going to talk about Rome. Uh, and I told Roz, is she in here? I need her in here because I was kind of going through some things with her. And I said, I need you to sit there and tell me if it's connected or not. That way I can stop and slow down. But she'll be back in here, I'm sure, in a minute. But, or maybe I ran her off by what I was telling her I was going to teach on. Okay. Um, so we're going to go to 17 just to build the foundation. If you're new to the study... Um, just, just hold on, we're going to get to the New Testament, okay? But here's where we're starting. In Revelation 17, there's three stools to the New World Order. The New World Order at the end of the age, at the end of uh, the, the age, Jesus would say. Three legs to the stool. There's a future religion part, there's a future government, and there's a future economy. So in Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, God fills us in on this future religion. And our key verses are 4 and 5. So if you're listening online, we're going to read verses 4 and 5 of 17. If somebody would like to read those for us. So this is one of the most descriptive pieces about a religious system that you'll find in the Bible. And I'm just going to pick some things out. If you look at the screen or in your Bible, notice that she is decked out. Materialism, materialism, money, power, elitism. Notice that she has a cup of abominations in her hand, uh, worldliness. Notice that she has a filthiness of fornication, false doctrine. Okay, got to look ahead to that. And the woman represents the false religion. That'll be the one world religion at the end of the time. That'll use the platform of the church. It'll look like the Christian church in some form or fashion. Tonight we're going to actually flirt a little bit with... One of the major identities, and, and some will get upset if they're listening online, okay? I'm just going to tell you, it's coming, uh, but I'm going to back it up with the Word of God, okay? So here's the one world religion that we're going to look at, and I know, I've picked out some parts here for you. Notice the initial part, the mother came from where? Babylon, all right. Let's go to 17 verses 7, 10, and 11. Somebody like to read that? That's the one world government. Somebody read, uh, and, 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 and you'll notice that she's riding on this beast, so... The false religion is married to the government. It's an imperial religion. It's an imperial religion. That's important to remember. It's a state religion. So somebody read for 7, 10, and 11, please, of 17. So, 
and he is the se- and yeah, he is of the seventh that goeth into perdition of the seventh. Now, there's a lot of uh, it seems like difficult phrases there, so let's just slow down. And as we read it, the beast is a one world government. So imagine a one world government as a big old bear or a big old beast that's 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 moving uh, through the field. And the one world religion is married to that government as a, symbolized by a woman on a beast. And so the beast, the one world government, has seven kings. Look at verse 10. Seven kings. Let's make it simple. So this new world order has been found or will be found in seven different rulers, right? And he says in history, five of those rulers or empires have come and gone. But those five had the elements of the one world government and the one world religion. Five have come and gone. One is at the present time, which has to be Rome because that's the time that this was written. So Rome exemplifies the one world government pieces and the one world religion. That's what we're going to come to tonight. And some people are going to be upset. And the other is one yet to come. And when he cometh, he is of the seventh. Uh, uh, He'll be the eighth, okay? So make it clear. One world religion, one world government has been shown through ancient empires throughout time. So then that took us, and of course here's the target we're going to get to tonight. Then said unto them, take heed, beware of the leaven. Everybody say leaven. Of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then Mark 8 and 15. And he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the what? Of the Pharisees and 11 of the Herodians or Herod. So we began this journey. And, and if you've not been with us, just hold on. But this journey began in the plains of Shinar, the Tower of Babel. And that the Tower of Babel was the first attempt for one world government by Nimrod, the son of Cush, the great, the great grandson of of Noah. And we know that God was not pleased with that, right? God told him that was not a good thing, that he wanted them to scatter throughout the whole earth. He didn't want a one world government. And I showed you in Acts where Paul said that God has actually made the different nations of the world. But at this time, this one world government was led by Nimrod and then his wife, Semiramis. And we talked about how that she was considered uh, the goddess of forces. And that comes out in Daniel. We'll show you that when we start talking about where the Antichrist is going to come from. The goddess of forces. She started an ancient pagan religious cult. No coincidence, she's a woman. No coincidence that her cult demanded that you drink the potion of their cult to become a member. It was an elitist group of priests. And it started at the Tower of Babel. And they had the Satan's counterfeit. Tammuz was the divine son. After Nimrod died, somehow through sun rays, he became a god and impregnated Semiramis. And she had Tammuz as a divine child, who was Nimrod incarnate. Sounds a lot like our gospel, doesn't it? You can find all this in pagan religion history. So then the first empire that we've seen that it showed up was in Egypt, who had a very powerful government, ruling class. They would oppress the Israelites, that's why they were in slavery, hard taskmasters, killed their children. And they had the gods of Osiris and Isis, which corresponds to the ancient Mesopotamian gods, Nimrod and Semiramis. Same ones, just different names. And then they changed their flavor a little bit. It's like any god, you can change the flavor, but it got its basis from the Tower of Babel. That's empire number one. There's four more to go as far as history is concerned. The second empire, and we're, look how we're going through the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, First and Second Kings. See, we're putting, we're putting all the whole complete work of the Bible together in this, and it's pretty amazing. So then we go to First and Second Kings, and we learn about the Assyrians coming in, Elijah, and then Hezekiah, and all those kings. They had to deal with Assyria, and Assyria had gods that got their origins from Nimrod and Semiramis, Asher, uh, Ishtar, and then Marduk, the god of Jupiter. It's kind of what it turned into, Baal Marduk, and that's where you find, uh, and you're gonna, I'm going to talk about it, I think it might be in New York or Washington, there's a, there's a statue of a bull man, uh, and uh, it represents the Old Testament god that they would sacrifice their kids to, and it, it, there's statues in our nation of that by the way. Uh, And so this religion is not ancient. It's still alive today. But let's get there. All right, so it's two empires. Let's go to the third one. Of course, we know Babylon. 
So Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar represented a one world government. And uh, I believe it was a socialistic type of government for sure. Um, it was very socialistic uh, according to his dream and the prophecy. And they worshipped Ishtar, which was Semiramis, and Baal, which can find its origins back to Nimrod. And then the wise men were introduced. Now, the wise men are very important because the wise men began to, to become that priestly system of Semiramis that we talked about, that ancient priest. We talked about how they came from the, as a Median tribe, from the Median or Medes and Persians. And so the wise men were taken into Babylon, and they began to try to take this religion and that religion and that religion, and they merged them, and they kept compiling them and bringing them in uh, to this ancient religion of Babylon. And we talked about how that there's so much, so much in the wise men religion that points to New Age churches today, and that's going to be an exciting study as we look at some of the very famous contemporary churches and their songs and the things they sing. But they have things like witchcraft and sorcery, divination, fortune telling, magic, astrology, the zodiac, mysticism, and they believed in rituals. And so they were taking all these other religions and, and putting it into mysticism and divination. Do you know there's churches today that when they have, Christian churches, when they have their youth rallies and stuff, that they have card reading tables? They, they, they teach their, their young youth how to read cards to tell the prophecy and our, our new generation, they love that stuff. This ain't gone anywhere. This is still here. And so the wise men in Babylon then had a greater role in the Median Persian Empire. And they represent the form of this one world religion. They kept trying to punch into God's, God's faith and God's religion and God's doctrine. And so the wise men under the Medes and the Persians, the story of Esther. That, you know, you just don't see these things until you study this. How that uh, in the story of Esther, we learned that the wise men, this ancient Persian priestly cult, back to the time of the Tower of Babel, that now they had gained such political power, they were making the laws. The king was asking them about laws. I showed you that in Esther. They were setting up the judges. They were judging over the laws. You had to be a wise man to be a judge. You had to be a graduate of the wise man's school to be a king in the Persian Empire. They now made kings, they now made laws, and they now judge laws, and they controlled the schools. What's that sound like? And so the wise men, uh, very influential, okay? Now we go to the next empire, the Grecian Empire, Alexander the Great. And I talked about how that under the Persian Empire, the Jewish people, this is important, under this empire, the Jewish people were captive still of Babylon in which they encountered the wise men. How do we know that they encountered the wise men? Because Daniel was made chief of the wise men, so they would learn the teachings of Daniel. That's how the wise men knew Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem, if you didn't know that. So they began to take Judaism and mix it into this ancient pagan cult religion. Zoroasterism in Iran is a form of it. It's a lot new age religion. They began to mix it into Judaism, okay? Um, and so the Jewish people were allowed to go back to Jerusalem under the Persian kings, Ezra, Nehemiah, and the book of the Chronicles. Now, when they went back, this is very important. I'm going to read you a prophecy tonight. It's going to blow your mind. When they went back, they carried with them the teachings of the wise men. You know, uh, what was that saying Uncle James always said? If you let the devil play in your play in your backyard, he'll end up in the house. So when they went back, they went back with a compromised form of religion. Okay? And so when they went back under the Grecian Empire, Alexander the Great, Antiochus, or Antiochus the Fourth rose up after Alexander the Great, and he was an evil king. And I read you the prophecies in Daniel 11. He was the one that was a, few, that was a type of the Antichrist. He actually killed a hog in the temple. He did these things that we've read about the Antichrist. The reason he did that was he got mad because he removed the high priest of the temple. And he put up his own high priest of the Jewish people after they got back out of slavery and they rebuilt their temple Antiochus 
set up his own high priest who would give him the most sums of money. Okay? It's corrupt. And this high priest would vow to teach the ways of the Grecians and incorporate it into to the Jewish culture. It's called the Hellenistic period. And so Antiochus was an evil king. Well, at that time, there were beginning to rise up these political sects. And here's where we get the connection to the New Testament. The Sadducees. Anybody ever heard of the Sadducees? Raise your hand. All right. During this period, they were the priest that had made an allegiance with these Grecian kings. They were priests that believed in elitism. They were priests that believed that they uh, materialism and wealth. Remember what I read to you in Revelation 17? They were priests that believed in the first five books of the Old Testament, and that was it, nothing more. On the flip side of that was the Pharisees. This is, this is the time between the New Testament and the Old Testament. This is what's going on before Jesus comes on the scene. There's another group called the Pharisees. All right? And the Pharisees was another political sect that didn't like the Sadducees. They didn't like that they had compromised with the king. And so the Pharisees believed in the first five books of the New Testament. They believed in everything that was written in that called the Torah, the law. But then they added a bunch of oral laws. I mean, they, they were just laws for everything. For example, you couldn't look in a mirror on the Sabbath because you'd be tempted to pluck a hair out and that was called work. So when you see Jesus talking about all these things in the New Testament about these laws of the Sabbath, it came from these over-anxious Pharisees who didn't like the Sadducees. And so, uh, for example, if you're watching The Chosen, there's a scene in The Chosen where Nicodemus is approached by the Roman government. And he's told that the Roman government is upset that the Jewish fishermen are fishing on the Sabbath because they have vowed not to tax the people on their Sabbath. And so Nicodemus goes and holds this big teaching in The Chosen. It's a good scene. And he makes an oral law that it's unholy to fish on the Sabbath. They would just make these oral laws. They had 613 laws, you know. And so the Pharisees were this external good works, ritual, religion. The Sadducees were these imperialistic priests who had married the government. And so what you see forming now is what Jesus would stand against. Okay? And this happened before Jesus came on the scene. All right? And so the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and this is important, got their influence from the wise men when they came back from captivity. So the elements of the wise men, of being political powers, were found. The elements of the wise men, of all that mysticism and all that, was found with these men. And so what had happened is, this ancient cult religion had now began to get its feet in the door among God's people. And now we go to the Roman Empire. You ready? Ready. So we got the empire that now is. Turn with me, please, to uh, where do I want to go? Let's go. Uh, we've already talked about that. Let's go to, I've already talked about that. Okay. Uh, let's just review it. Sadducees, ruling elite, ruling elite priest, materialistic power position. God was concerned with only the writ law. It represents the marriage of church and state. They began the move of imperial religion. That means when the state, the government, uh, imposes a religion. The Pharisees, they came from the word from Persia. They believed in written and oral law, works and rituals, ceremony, willing to adopt new ideas into the law that came from the wise men, and obedience. External religion, ceremony, ritual, um, and obedience. All right, so Jesus didn't like them. Now let's get to some New Testament, some things that you can, you can really uh, sink into. Let's go to Matthew 12 and 34 with me, okay? So Matthew 12 and 34. Somebody wants to read, uh, read that for us. So now we're going to find this religion showing up, this ancient religion showing up in Jesus' time in the Roman Empire. It's what we're talking about. This is the next empire. And Jesus looked at these priests or this political group and he said unto them, you generation of vipers, how can you say one thing, 
but yet be something else. He was talking about how that they were snakes just any old way. All right? And so he's talking about their hypocrisy. Hypocrisy among the priest. Huh. All right? Let's go to Matthew 15 and 14, please. Matthew 15 and 14. Jesus knew how to talk tough. I mean, this is, this is trash talk Bible 101. I mean, he knew how to let them know what he wanted to let them know. All right? Matthew 15 and 14. Somebody want to read that? Okay, so Jesus said they're blind guides. Look, now look. Understand what's going on in the church. He said they're blind guides, but they're part of the visible church. They're part of the church. But God didn't put them there, and God will uproot them. They teach the, the word, they teach God's word erroneously, and God will remove their doctrine. But they're all, you got to get this. Everybody with me? They're already in the church. They're already there. They're mixed in. That's what you got to get. They're mi it's mixed in, Brother Lee. It's already happened. All right, Matthew 23. Verse, uh, actually, let's go to Matthew 23 and verse 13. Everybody say, whoa. whoa. All right, that's what this chapter's called, the woes. Yeah, whoa chapter. All right, Jesus gives them seven woes to the Pharisees. He really don't like this group. I know he loves them. He died for them, but he doesn't like them. All right, Matthew uh, 23, and let's go to verse uh, 13. Somebody read verse 13 for me. Now listen, these were like the pastors. And he looks at him and he says, Woe unto you, you hypocrites, scribes and Pharisees. Woe unto you. All right? Uh, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven. You block people from going to heaven. You stand in their way. There's something about this religion Jesus doesn't like, isn't it? All right, let's go to verse 14. Uh, I'm sorry, no, let's go to verse uh, 25. Somebody read verse 25 of Matthew 23. He's saying your emphasis is on external things and ritualism. You know, being part of the choir. Or I don't know, you know, uh, uh, having this great breakout contemporary church service. But when God looks at your heart, he sees something that's nasty and dirty. He called him another time. He said, you're whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you've been whitewashed. Everybody know what whitewash is? He said, but on the inside, you're full of dead bones. There's no life inside. You've not been born again. Is there churches today being led by people who's truly not been born again? I'd say, yeah, I believe so. He said, you're full of externalism and ritualism. Okay? And that's the problem now remember, this is a direct connection to that ancient religion that we followed. Every term that Jesus is calling them out on is a form of what we've been going through the whole Old Testament about. This false religion is now showing up in the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the very religious leaders of God's people. How did that happen? Because they were under that influence in Babylon and Persia. And they brought it all the way back to them to the New Testament. Now Jesus is here to confront it, okay? All right, let's look in verse uh, 24, please. Verse 24. Somebody read verse 24. Matthew 20. Has anybody ever got a gnat in their, in their mouth? Yeah, or in your eye? That's awful. He says, you strain at a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What's he talking about? Their legalistic attitude. J. Vernon McGee tells a story about a woman, the lipstick woman, he says. He said, this woman was animate about not for women not to dress up and wear lipstick. But she was known as the town gossip. He said, maybe she should have put a little bit more lipstick on her lips so the gossip wouldn't be on her tongue. A very legalistic type of, a very legalistic type of church. A very ritualistic type of church. A very ceremonial type of church. A very priest elitist type of church. 
We're going somewhere. How about verse 27? Have we read that one yet? Somebody read that. Hypocrisy. All right. So no life. A dead church. Dead church leaders. All right. So now I've set the stage. What was Jesus battling? What was he fighting? What is the prophecy part of Jesus' teaching? Let's go to Matthew 13. This is going to really, uh, really enlighten you, okay? What's going on in the Roman Empire? Remember, I've chased, we've chased it, haven't we? We've chased it back to Genesis after the flood. Samirmus so and Nimrod. And we've shown how that it showed up in Egypt, the government and the religion. And we've showed how that the next major empire on the world today was Assyria, and it showed up there. Separate from God's people, but it keeps showing up. Then we showed how it was there in Babylon, with Nebuchadnezzar. And then it started to mix and mingle through the wise men. And then we saw in the Persian uh, Empire how that he let them go back. And when they went back, they took the ideals of the wise men to mix and mingle. And then under the Grecian Empire, we showed how the Pharisees and Sadducees rose up. Showing how it began to mix in. Let's see what that has to do with what Jesus says concerning the prophecy of this one world religion. This is going to really get you. Now, Matthew 13 is the parables. You know that? It's the the parables. Now, do you know? Let me ask you. This is important to, to really rightly divide the parables. What is Jesus talking about in the parables? They're not just a collection of sayings for common teachings. There's a theme of the parables of Matthew 13. Do you know what it is? If you read the previous chapters, Jesus has offered the kingdom to the Jewish people. He even sends his disciples out, go read it. And they reject the king. So now Jesus is showing what's going to happen. Since they've rejected him, he's going to go to the Gentiles. He's showing what's going to happen from the moment he ascends to the moment he comes back. And what's, what identity is he talking about? Well, a lot of people say, well, he's talking about the church. Well, he kind of is, but not really. He's talking about Christendom. Christendom. Now, when I say there's two terms, and for people who really study, there's two terms you'll find in these parables. Kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. You say, well, there's no difference. Yeah, there's a difference. When he talks about the kingdom of heaven... He's talking about the sphere of the whole earth under heaven. Everybody that professes to be a Christian, true or false, Christendom, every identity that says they're a Christian church, Protestant or not, is included in these Matthew 13. He's talking about what's going to happen to Christendom from the moment that he leaves to the moment he comes back. And it had already started with the Pharisees and Sadducees. It had already began. I want you to see why. So now this makes it, these parables really take on a little bit more meaning because they're prophetic in nature. They're very prophetic in nature. What's going to happen with the organized church from the moment Jesus ascends until he comes back? Let's go to the very first parable. Let's look at 13. What's the very first parable? What's it about? Who can tell me? Verse 3, what's it about? The sower. So the sower went forth... And he sowed seeds, right? We know that. Some fell by the wayside. That's the travel path. That's the path that's traveled through the the fields. That's hard. Verse 5, some fell on the stony places, rocks sticking up. All right, and they withered away. Verse 7, some fell among the thorns. And then some fell among good ground and brought about good fruit. Let's connect the two. What's he talking about? What's going to happen in Christendom? From the moment he leaves to the moment he comes back. Let's get the interpretation. You ready? Let's get the interpretation. Uh, Let's go ahead and read uh, verses uh, 19 through 23. Somebody read that for us. 19 through 23 of 13. Let's read the interpretation.
Okay, so what's he saying? The time that Jesus ascends, the time he comes back, the sower is Jesus or even the preacher. They're going to sow the seed, which is the gospel. Among Christendom and sitting in the pews are going to be those who profess Christ but truly have a hard heart and they never surrender to the gospel. They're false professors. They're not true Christians. And then there's others that, that the, the seed fell among their stony heart. All right? And, 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 and then there's others that it fell among the thorns, which is the cares of the world, and it never really took. Three out of four cases, in the organized church, the gospel does not take root. But one in four, they believe. From the moment Jesus ascends to when he comes back, the church will be full of people who, number one, truly believe, and three other cases that they cannot believe. Do you see that? That's what it means. And so Christendom or the organized church will be full of that every Sunday. Every Sunday, all right? Let's go to the wheat and the tares. Let's look at the, the next one, the wheat and the tares, in verse 24 through 30. All right, I'm just going to walk through it for a minute. Look in verse 24 with me. There's a man. That man is Jesus who sowed the good seed. What's the good seed? The what? The gospel. Into the field, which is the world. And then an enemy came and sowed tares. Now, something you got to know about tares. They're a darnell seed. All right? They're like, uh, they look just like the seed of wheat. They grow up and they look the same. But yet, once they grow up, you can only tell the difference at the end when they produce their fruit. And you got to be careful because if you eat them, they're prone to getting the poisonous fungi in their fruit. So they're really a poisonous wheat. They're a false wheat that's poison. And he said, I've got the good wheat in which the good man sold that's grown up. But then we got these tares that the enemy sown that's grown up together. And I can't tell if this one's wheat or if this one's tares. You know, a lot of preachers think it's their job to pull out the tares. You better be careful because you may preach and pull out the tares. You may pull out some wheat. You see. So what's this all mean? Who's the enemy? The good man is Christ. He's sowing the gospel. And during the time of Christendom, some are being saved and believe. But the enemy, which is the devil, is sowing false doctrine. And the false Christians, the professors who are not truly Christians, are growing up together. When? Prophetic, when? At the time of Christendom. In the modern church, you don't know if somebody is wheat or tare sitting beside you. Don't know. And it's going to happen until he comes back. What's he say? The, the servants come to him. If you read there, uh, actually go to uh, verse 36. The servants come to him and say, do you want us to pull up the tares? And he says, no, don't do that. He said, you may pull up some of my wheat. Look in verse 37. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. That's Jesus. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. That's the true believers. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy, the devil, verse 39, has sold them. So the harvest will come at the end of the world when Jesus comes back. He'll separate them out. And as therefore the tares will be gathered and burned in the fire, which is at the end of the world. Cast them, verse 42, into the furnace of fire. These false professors, these false Christians. So again, that's prophetic in nature. We're getting a picture of the organized church. Believers and unbelievers all together. All right? Let's look at the next parable. Let's look at the next parable, okay? Um, uh, where's it at? I need it in verse 31 and 32. Somebody read that for us. 31 and 32. So this study has changed my theology on the parables. I have preached that, I believe, as the gospel and good and growing. But if you keep it in context, what is he saying here? The mustard seed never represents the children. They always are wheat or fruit. The mustard seed is a humble beginning, but it will grow to something that has extreme power Political power, Sadducees. It'll grow to where kings will tremble under it. 
and the birds, which are, Daniel chapter 4, Wolverd, leaders influenced by demonic forces. There's just some evil leaders in this world. They will attach themselves to this form of the church. I want you to grasp that. It'll start at the humble beginnings with the apostles. But it'll turn and grow into something very different. Something that'll reach the whole world and stand as a great political power. To where the evil leaders of this world will even find their place in it. What are we looking at? We're looking at something that there's true in non-believers. They're going to grow up together. We're looking at something that turns into something that was never intended to be. A mighty political force and power. Jesus said that's what's going to happen. Between the time period that I leave and I come back. This ancient one world religion. This new world order. Will come and dominate the people of God. That's what, that's what these parables are all about. Now let's get. J. Vernon McGee says that chapter 13. Is the most important. Uh, Matthew is the most important book of the Bible. And then he says chapter 13 is the most important chapter of Matthew. Then he says verse 33 is the most important verse of chapter 13. So he says, probably reading the most important verse. Did you know that? J. Vernon McGee thinks what we're getting ready to read is the most important verse in all the Bible. Somebody read for us this next parable, chapter 33 for us, please. Uh, Verse 33, chapter 13. Now, mom makes bread, and I don't know, I can't tell you how that is. All right, but there's got to be some yeast, I think. Right? So we've got actually three characters here. I should have put this up here. Here we go. We've got three major points. We got leaven. Wonder what that is. Everything connects here. I need your attention. Everything connects right here. It happens here. We've got. A woman. Well, we know, we've seen what a woman represents. And we got meal. Meal comes from wheat. The gospel, the seed, the true produce, the wheat. Guess what that represents? The good, the true believers, the true church. Remember, the organized, in the organized church is false and true believers. And Jesus said, let it continue to the end of the age. Didn't he say that? I read that to you. In Christendom, you're going to have true believers and false believers. And Jesus said, don't try to pluck them out. Because when it comes time for judgment, I'll look into their heart. And I'll determine whether they have truly professed me as their Savior or not. But in the name of the church... There's going to be many, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees priest, who believes in imperialistic state religion, externalism, ritual, hypocrisy. And they're going to be there. And Jesus said, let them grow together. Let them grow together. But something is important here that's going to happen. There's going to be the meal. This is the good. This is the professing church, the true church. But a woman is going to bring in leaven. That's evil doctrine. Schofield says it's evil doctrine and wickedness. The Dake Bible will tell you that it's always evil doctrine. J. Vernon McGee says 98 times in the Bible, leaven is always used in a bad sense. Therefore, this parable teaches the intrusion of false doctrine that is finally married into the church. Word married. To bring about the final apostasy of the end times. This is where it happens. This ancient religion and paganism gets mixed in to the pure gospel. So who's the woman? Who's the woman? We know who the woman is. You need some Bible background? What was the name of Nimrod's wife? Where was she from? Where was the Tower of Babel? Somebody go to Genesis 11. Carmen, we'll get Genesis 11 for us and find out where they tried to set up the Tower of Babel. Everybody else go to Zechariah 5. <laughs> Say it louder, John. Plains of Shinar, Iraq, Babylon. Who is this woman? 
Who is this woman? What is her leaven? What is the leaven that will mix into the church during the time that Jesus ascends and before he comes back? Well, let's back it up, Brother Steve. Why do you think TJ's taken six months to build this up to this moment? I'm so excited. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 5. This is a funny, funny prophecy. I'm going to tell you, it takes some studying to get this one. All right, Zechariah 5, verse, I'm going to read it 6 to 11, if you're with me. Look what it says. Here's a prophecy and a vision. And I said unto this messenger, Zechariah 5 and 6, I said to this messenger, what is it? And he said, this is an epath. That's a basket, of, uh, that's a bushel basket. So imagine up here a bushel basket. He says, I see a bushel basket up here. Now look at this. This is amazing. He said, moreover, this is the resemblance through all the earth. Whatever I'm getting ready to show you now has reached out through all the earth. One world religion. New world order. Ain't that what we're studying? And behold, there was lifted up a talon of lead. All right, that's about 122 pounds, I think. There was a lid on this bushel basket of lead of 122 pounds to try to keep whatever's on the inside on the inside. What is on the inside that God didn't want out? And in that bushel basket, verse 7, there is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the bushel basket that God didn't want out, but she couldn't be kept in the basket. And he said, this is Miss Wickedness, mother of harlots, you can put. And he cast her in the midst of the basket again. And he cast the weight of the lead upon it to try to keep her in. Verse 9, then I lifted up my eyes, and behold, there came out two women. Just a side note, how many women in the Bible were called Jezebel? It happened twice. She was out of the basket twice. I preached on one. You remember that? Elijah on Mount Carmel? The other Jezebel I'm going to read to you here at the end of the lesson. Two Jezebels came, and the wind was in their wings, and they pick up that basket. Verse 9, like a wings of a stork. And they lift up that bushel basket between heaven and earth. They fly in the clouds. Then I said to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the basket? Where are they taking it? Look in verse 11. He'll put chills on you. And he said unto me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar. So it shall be established and it can have its own base. At some point, whatever started with Semiramis, all the pagan rituals, as it went through each empire, it would adapt some and compromise some and change. And then it got to the Babylon Empire and was introduced to a man named Daniel and he said, ooh, Judaism. And he kept trying to push in and kept trying to push in. The Pharisees and the scribes brought it back to Judah. In the time of Jesus, he stood against it and denounced it. And then Jesus gave a parable of prophecy and said there's going to come a time when Christendom is growing. And this ancient religion is going to sow its leaven in the middle of my good meal until the end, until what? The whole is full of its doctrine. When would that ever happen? We have went through five empires. The question is when and how? Did that happen in church history? That paganism was married to the Christian church? That's our question. That'll be next study. We're going to get a couple scriptures here to help us out. Go to Revelation chapter 2. We're going back there finally through the whole Bible. All right, Revelation chapter 2. Any questions before I finish? Ask me. Any questions? Anybody need to say, wait a minute, TJ, go back to that point. Anything? Okay, either I did a great job or you don't really want to know. <laughs> I, I don't know how to make a simple statement about it. Somebody help me make a simple statement about what, what we've just went through everything. Somebody help me. What have I just shown in that last parable, huh? That's awesome. That's a good statement, Diane. That's a lot more simple than I can make it. That's great. 
And so at some point, it's actually going to marry itself into the church. The professed church. And how's it going to do that? You said humanistic and materialistic, didn't you? Well, let's go back. Remember the target? Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the false doctrine of the Pharisees. Externalism, ritual, hypocrisy, and that influence of those wise men. That leaven's going to mix in the church. And like what Brother Steve said, and of the Sadducees, which was materialism, Power, imperial religion, marriage of church and state. And then look what he says. Beware the leaven of the Herodians. This was a third political party married to the Pharisees who hated Jesus. They were Hellenistic Jews. Remember that Antiochus I was talking about? They rose up out of Antioch and said, hey, let's mix some Greek stuff into this religion. And they represent worldliness. So as Brother Steve said, you're going to get a humanistic, new age worldly, materialistic, uh, hypocritical church in the end days. It really brings meaning to that that verse that says, In the last days, perilous times will come, men shall become lovers of their own own self. Remember those verses? I'm going to quote you from a Schofield not to get in trouble. Go back to Revelation chapter 2. When did this happen? I don't know. Maybe it hasn't happened. We can use history to say if it did happen, it's going to probably look like this, whatever this happened. So I'm not telling you this is when it happened. I'm telling you when it does happen, it's going to be like this example, and I'm going to get in detail next time. Or it has already happened, and this is the ticket. Let's read Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. He's speaking to the church of Pergamos. And he says, But I have a few things against thee. Remember, these letters to the churches represents right before Jesus comes back. We studied these about a year and a half ago. They represent through church history the the spiritual problems with churches, but they also represent prophetic pieces of church history. This is the spiritual condition of the church before Jesus comes back. I have a few things against thee because... Thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now the doctrine of Balaam is known in biblical theology as the doctrine of worldliness. I'm not going to get into that. This church that Jesus sent a letter to said you're a very worldly church. All right, look in verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The word Nike comes from that. Conqueror. The Nicolaitans represent a priestly order or a priest elite. He says, in my church, you have brought the doctrine of worldliness and you've brought a priestly order. You're going to this priest and you're going to that priest and you're confessing your sins. And I've told you in Hebrews, you're not to do that. There's only one priest between heaven and earth. There's only one mediator between God and man. And it's not Father so-and-so, but it is Jesus Christ the righteous. That's what he said. I'm just reading the Bible to you. Do you know in church history, Schofield, Dake, let me, let me give you the commentators that I'm, that I'm agreeing with, or not agreeing with, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. I'm, the, the commentators that make this point, Wolverd, Schofield, Tim LaHaye, Gary C. Cohen. This was the church in Pergamos that had the first temple to Caesar. In Pergamos was the first initial act of imperialism religion. And up to this point, the Christian church had been persecuted. But next week, learn that Constantine supposedly converted to Christianity, Christendom, and he embraced a Christian religion into the state church, and it became the Catholic church.
Let's continue to read. Revelations 2 and 20. Let's read that one. This is the next church. Okay? Uh, and it says, The next letter, the next church. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast suffered that woman Jezebel. There's the second Jezebel woman. What did she do? She called herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. It's already took root. The leaven is already growing in the midst of the church. Schofield, quote, I'm quoting Schofield. Been here a lot longer than me. Read that. Read that on the screen. The papacy developed out of the Pergamos state. Worldliness and priesthood. Jezebel brought idolatry into Israel. Look at what it says. Romanism under Constantine has now wedded the Christian doctrine to pagan ceremonies. Now, I'm not saying that's it. But come back next time because I'm going to talk about in that image right here. This represents Babylon. This represents Media Persia. This represents Greece. This represents Rome and when the one world religion or that false doctrine got into the church. And then down here represents ten toes, iron mixed with clay. There was ten tribes during the dark ages that would not recognize the state church. Those ten tribes are no longer because we know what happened. During the conversion of the world. Y'all know what that war was called? When the church went about trying to, to uh, convert everybody in the middle and dark ages. What was that holy war called, Jason? Huh? Yes, crusades. So what I'm teaching to you tonight is whether this is it or it looks very much like this when it happens. God has given us an example to look at, at when the one world religion takes over. It'll come through the church somehow, some way. Maybe it is just a new age. Maybe it is a compilation of all, but it's going to have the very same elements and doctrine that we've read throughout the Bible. Now, you say, well, pastor, I'm going to disagree with you. Well, you better open up your Bible and show me. Because I've spent six months showing you and building it up to get where we're at. All right, we love you. Come back next week and uh, we'll get a little, uh, we're going to get into modern times. We're going to get into modern presidents. We're going to get into modern nations around the world. We're going to get into the relationship with the Crusades and the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages. Uh, We've got a lot of things to talk about. Maybe I get Jason. Maybe get Jason. He knows more about that stuff than I do. He's a history teacher, but uh, I'm just trying to, trying to learn history. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we're probably going to talk about a few of them, maybe. But. All right, we love you. Brother, let's all stand. Brother John, will you dismiss us in prayer?